John, lovely to see you again. Um, and as you know, we've been up to all sorts of exciting things at Sutton Who, the reconstruction of the boat and geophysics, GPR, very advanced 21st century things. It struck me, and I thought of you at this point, that you encapsulated in the dig the idea of Mrs. Pretty, Basil Brown, Robert, looking into the past mm -hmm. and in a sense using their imagination to say what is under those mounds and now somewhat strangely I suppose we have a 21st century version of looking into the past which is not always 100% certain but we are now taking GPR and geophysics to those sites looking at what might be there how, how do you feel about that well, I feel it's fantastic, actually. I mean, I, you know, one of the things that struck me when I was researching the book was I remember going to the British Museum and I seem to remember the, the, everything from Sutton who was, if it wasn't actually stuck in a corridor, it was stuck somewhere incredibly sort of unprepossessing and there was very little information about how everything had come to light and certainly no sense of drama about it at all and since then of course you know we have to some extent gone to the opposite extreme and to me i can't see anything you know the more research the more publicity the better as far as i'm concerned and what's interesting i think for me is that um i imagine a world often when i'm there i was in mrs pretty's house mm. Um, and, and very kindly, the National Trust had dug into their archives. And when Martin Carver was writing his book, yeah. which is a fantastic book yeah. about Sutton Hoo, he'd use Victor Ambrose's drawings. Right. And there are, there are five, six Victor Ambrose original drawings of the burial, the boat. And finding those was like putting me in touch with an old friend again. But I was standing in Mrs. Pretty's house, looking out at the window. You can't quite see the mounds because of the trees. And I was thinking of, of you know, the vision that we might be able to create in, you know, this time, a, a second dreaming of the boat, if you like, is not only the geophysics of the wider area, the bigger landscape, the connection with Rendlesham, <laughs> but also the idea of building this thing, rebuilding a 90 foot long boat and actually rowing it yeah. at sea. And, and every time I think of that, I think oh, they could have seen this in a way. And I wondered if you could, with your narrative hat on, I thought, well, I'm pretty sure if I talk to John, he'll be able to imagine a storyline somehow through this with a bit of thought. Oh my God, that's a very, very, well, you know, I could certainly put my mind to it. I mean, you know, to me, when I wrote the book, which of course is a long time ago now, I mean, you know, it's getting on for 20 years ago, I wrote the book, but the fact that, that the boat itself had decayed and essentially what was left was this kind of crust of hard sand was for me, one of the most poignant and evocative things about the whole story, which is you had something that was sort of there, but not there, which in a way, you know, spoke volumes about our attitudes towards the distant past. Um, but now, now that the, 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 the ship is actually being reconstructed, I mean, I remember, you know, I was looking Looking at the um, the little presumably computer generated image of the ship going down the estuary, and I think what struck me most of all was how incredibly beautiful it is. And I mean, what an extraordinary, elegant shape! And just sort of seeing it in the water, albeit the computer generated water, uh, I mean, it's just the most kind of stirring, evocative sight. And I think what's interesting about the process too. We worked with someone called Damien Goodburn on Time Team. We did Sea Henge, we did a log boat with him. And I remember when we did Sea Henge, he was 
he's very much about authenticity and the mm -hmm. Sutton Hoo Ships Company are trying to preserve all those authentic elements. They're using the tools, using the wood from local woods, yeah. um, this kind of thing. And when, when Damien achieved that, and that he, that's some, uh, you have to be very determined with these big sort of projects, mm -hmm. as you can imagine. I mean, this might last a couple of years and they've yeah. got some wonderful people there. If you do it as authentically as possible and you, you end up with this thing you've created, a bit like the Sea Henge thing, when yeah. we walked into it, all of us felt a presence about mm. what had been created. Mm. The skill, mm. the hand, the tools, the wood, the way people had worked on it, you finally got something and it had, it was more than just a reproduction. Somehow when you step on board that ship, yes. I'm hoping that it will feel like there's an essence to it that will somehow, I mean, that might be the old hippie in me, of course, but I'm hoping but, and, and in me as well, of course. But I mean, it, I think you're right because it. What struck me seeing the reproduction was just this sense of how lovingly fashioned it had been, and that absolutely came through in the reproduction. I'm sure you know once the the, the boat is actually built you know, the process of taking it down onto the water and, you know, by Woodbridge and everything um, will be extraordinarily evocative. And I really do believe that, you know, there are occasions in life where a window is flung open to the past and, you know, it may not stay, stay open very long, but nonetheless, I'm sure that will be one of those occasions. And of course, the other thing that we're asking ourselves the question in the various things we're thinking of doing over the next year is there we have the boat how much can we rebuild the 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 chamber and uh, the person who was in it yeah and as i don't know you know how much your researches took you into radweld uh, country yeah 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 but here was a man who with his queen, um, eventually uh, went to war with Elfrith and won a battle, the, the River Idol. And Elfrith was nobody's idea of a pushover. Elfrith had attempted to bribe him three times to give up Edwin. He sent three offers of money, and, and Radweld was slightly beginning to think, oh, maybe I don't want war, and maybe if just cost me Edwin and his wife said to him no you should preserve your honor you should protect Edwin and Edwin would later become um, the big Brett Walder of, of Northumbria and Durham right, the hero right. of these. and I think Red World sounds like something out of the Game of Thrones to me yeah, yeah, yeah. and the joy uh, the thing where it connects to the archaeology is the fact that he, he went to Kent got baptized came back built a temple and in the temple was a christian altar on one side and a pagan altar on the other and as an archaeologist i want to know where's that temple uh, and where's yes. this hall because it's such an intriguing idea of people hedging their bets in terms of an afterlife and faith and you realize i suppose that you know there's a sense that you look upon people's religious conversion is a bit like whatever happened to St. Paul, that was kind of flash of blinding light and everything like that. But in reality, of course, it was much, much more kind of tentative than that, which is, you know, if I go a little bit down that path, can, am I, you know, more likely to uh, redeem myself or, or, you know, gain an afterlife and everything than if I go down that path? So, I mean, I, that to me is a very human process and a rather engaging one. And it's interesting for me, and you'll have to tell me if I've got this correct. In the book, uh, Mrs. Pretty reads to Robert from the story of Orpheus. God, does she? Yes. She may um, have done. I've completely forgotten it. <laughs> it's a very nice moment. Um, does she? Uh, uh, and I'll refer you to your own book here. Oh, page my gosh. 39. Uh, and this is Mrs. Pretty talking, if you don't mind me quoting a bit of it. Oh. 
I picked up a copy of the tales of the Greek heroes from the pile of books. I read how Orpheus loved his wife, Eurydice, so much that after she died from a snake bite, he went down into the underworld to try to bring her back into the realm of the living. Yeah. Now, quite yeah. interestingly That's for me, yes. this is a, a Greek view of what happens when you die. Yeah. Here we have an Anglo-Saxon rag world, possibly yeah. hedging his bets. We'll see whether the Christian king or, the, or Thor or Odin. So I'll keep my hand in with both of them. And it seemed to me that in, in my mind, I thought this, in a sense, was Robert slightly trying to ask the question, what happens when we die? Yeah. He, he was conscious of his mother's ill health, I guess. Yeah. Um, she was conscious of her own tenuous grip on her health. And here we had a burial, which had Christian bits and things like that. But I think in the film, they made Robert into a science fiction enthusiast. Yes, they did do that, which is, I mean, I, I mean, I didn't really have any particular parts of play in it. I mean, the reason that the whole story of Robert and his mother struck such a chord with me was because I suppose I grew up in, in quite similar circumstances. My father was ill most of the time that I was growing up and and he actually died when i was 18 but that was you know he'd been ill certainly for 10 11 years so i i was used to growing up as an only child like robert um under this great shadow um and of course what you want is you're absolutely torn between, on the one hand, wanting certainty, but you don't want the wrong kind of certainty. You know, you you basically want the certainty that everything's going to be all right. You don't want to be told um, everything's not going to be all right. So you kind of cling to certainty and to uncertainty at the same time, if that makes any sense. I'm, I was interested, and I don't know whether this is the case. I don't know how we get the answer to this, but I felt that they'd taken the Orpheus connection, if you like, and rather updated it and allowed Robert in it, which I think was an interesting idea. You know, if, if, yeah. if sci-fi, we fly up to space, yeah, is exactly. that a metaphor? Yeah, and you know, I, I like that. And of course it was, you know, it was the heyday of those kind of Flash Gordon films and everything like that. Um, and they, you know, that sort of notion of intergalactic warriors does sort of chime in a bit with, you know, Sutton who and Anglo-Saxons and all the rest of it. So it didn't bother me at all. No, I, I thought it was quite interesting they made that transition. Mm -hmm. And I had a vision when we were talking about it the other day of, in a sense, that, you know, we combine the Sutton who boat with the burial. If we do it properly, then in some way, this thing then heads off to the stars. Yeah, yeah, this is yeah, a sort yeah, of yeah, metaphor yeah. for that for that journey that, you know, because it's it's both a Christian and a pagan metaphor. The boat as a, a journey in, in, into the next world, and I, I thought it was I thought it was an interesting moment. If you had some unfinished business with Sutton who. <laughs> Well, I don't what know would I'm... you like to know? What if, if you could say, look, time team, buzz off, and I'd like to know this, 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 and this. And so we begin a new chapter with a new set of impossible thoughts. Will there be treasure there, Robert says to Mrs. Pretty? Yeah, um, yeah. Will we find, what else is there waiting to be found and what would you like us to find? Well, I was always fascinated by the sand bodies that were found in the 60s, where you basically, again, you know, it's that thing like Sutton Hoof, something, the ship, which is both there and not there. And this extraordinary idea that a human being can literally transmute into sand. Um, I mean, nothing really encapsulates just how fragile life is than that. Um, so that that fascinated me and i mean just to, i mean uh, i mean oddly enough i was i remember that if you go along the kind of northern uh, arm of the deben estuary you eventually come to 
Bawdsey at the end of it. And my mother, there's a very bizarre house there, which has got sort of a bizarre amalgam of different architectural styles. And it's where radar was basically pioneered in the Second World War. And my mother was um, one of the first radar operators because uh, the man who invented radar thought that women would make much better radar operators because they were much more patient. And of course, there were many more of them than there were men at the time. And in a funny kind of way, radar, of course, is about something that's, you know, there and not there. So, I mean, I find that whole, there's something incredibly strange and mysterious for me about that whole part of the world. And interestingly enough, of course, that, you know, the invention of the radar during the Second World War ultimately led to the kind of radar we use on geophysical sites. Yeah, exactly. Um, and one of the people we're talking to, um, Helena Hammerow, we went with Helena to a field in Oxford, Sutton yeah. Courtney. We did the radar on a field and we were able to see the posts of a great hall, an Anglo-Saxon great hall. And it is a strange, you know, a, a vision, a kind of metaphor in a sense, because there's the field, apparently nothing there. You then do this magical thing on top of it yeah. and up comes post holes of, a, of a, a hall that's one of the great images of Anglo-Saxon life. You know, yeah. Bede quotes that lovely story of life being like a small bird from the cold, flies into the warmth of the hall for a few seconds, flies out the other. And, uh, uh, you know, those halls, it's one of the things we'd like to know. Where was Radwell's great yeah. hall? Yeah, yeah. Um, and, and we also want to find out where the community were, because it would have taken a lot of people... Uh, the estimated weight of this boat that they're building is between sort of six to eight tons empty and 15 tons laden. And right. I was talking to Sam Newton about how they got it up the hill to Sutton yeah. Hoo. How did they drag yeah. it? And this is a lot of people, and all those people would have been living there somewhere. There's three to 4,000 yeah. rivets in it. Where did they make them? So... No, the exactly. archaeologists normally say we love the pyramids but we want to know the, the village of the people who made the pyramids and that's another thing no, of course did. that would be absolutely fascinating and and you know would it have been cheap by jar with the mounds or would there have been a kind of respectful distance between you know what was essentially a cemetery and where they lived no it's it i agree it is absolutely extraordinary and I, I like the idea that somehow Robert's dream of what happened when you died and where that boat, what, what, they were packing valuable materials. The whole idea of being buried with all that stuff is a kind of mentality that after, you know, nearly a thousand years of Christianity, we find quite difficult to cope with. But as a metaphor, there's, yeah. there's always something, it's like Tutankhamun in a way, isn't it? Yeah, of course, exactly. So you have, you know, the boat that carries you off into the afterlife. And it is extraordinary that, you know, you've got, you know, it's such an archetype because you get it in England, you get it in, in, uh, yeah, in Egypt, you've got it in um, you know, Scandinavia. Um, so no, you know, it's an absolutely common thing. Have you ever been on a, a reconstruction of an Anglo-Saxon or Viking? No, never, I, never. Well, I'm going to book you in. Oh, in good, that would be fantastic. Times. I don't know if you've ever done any rowing, but... Uh, I have done some rowing a long time ago. Yeah, I wouldn't want to kind of, you know, <laughs> exaggerate my um, abilities here. Well, at the moment, we've got Helen, Helen Geek from Time Team. Helen, who is determined to get herself into rowing shape for in two years time so we're oh, hoping to have a few friends well the... maybe you should get ray fines involved because he's you know he really does know his stuff about sutton who and you know he's a suffolk boy well that would be rather nice i mean i want to know who the central character in this story is because yeah. you, you had basil brown and mrs pretty which was yeah. great yeah. who is the person who wants to know now, now we've got all this technology. Well, it's probably you, isn't it? <laughs> well, yes, I, I, 
I always feel I want to say not an archaeologist, an, an ordinary person, you know, like Mrs. Pretty was. So maybe we can find someone between us. I'm sure you can. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And John, I always ask you this. What are you up to at the moment? You've got a current I, project on? Yeah, I'm, uh, I've just written a three-part television drama about John Stonehouse, oh. who you may remember, yes. um, who was a Labour MP who faked his own death in 1974. Uh, so that's still going ahead at the moment. So I'm quite I'm busy on that. And how do you balance that contemporary world with the, was it a relief to go back into the past with Sutton Who? Because you're Yeah, I mean, I would have happily, I mean, I've, you know, I, I, I would have happily carried on writing novels after I did the dig, but actually they didn't work out very well. And I, so there was something about the dig that just absolutely sparked something within me that I'm not sure I could ever kind of get back. So partly out of kind of, you know, thinking, what the hell am I going to do? I started, you know, I did the very English scandal about the Jeremy Thorpe affair. I did a, a biography of Robert Maxwell. So I'm kind of, you know, trawling through 1970s reprobates at the moment. But I'm again, I'm kind of running out. I would love to have a drink with you somewhere in Woodbridge or, or something. Yeah, that sounds great. We could sit down and discuss Sutton Who the Dig too. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, yes. Perhaps, perhaps we can get Ray Fines interested in being the the person who um, asks the question: What do we need to do? As I was talking to Martin Carver, he reminded me that in the reconstruction he'd been in, the Viking reconstruction, it was all being filmed by the BBC, and it yeah. sank spectacularly. Who did it? Bloody hell! Yeah, well, <laughs> yes, because actually Simon Jenkins was saying, I think he was saying that there was some doubt about whether the Sutton Hoo boat was ever intended to be seaworthy. Yes. Well, there's a question about, it certainly was seaworthy, I think, but the big question is whether it could also sail, because oh, the see, right. earlier okay. boats had 40 people rowing, and trying to get 40 people coordinated to all yeah, rowers yeah, yeah, at the same yeah. time. And maybe it just went up and down the coast. But anyway, that's I will keep you informed and send okay. you updates. Great. And uh, we might uh, ask certain who ships company if we could save you at least one position <coughs> in the prow as the scribe, perhaps. Oh my God! Yeah, well, <laughs> keep me well out of the you know where I could <laughs> screw anything up because I will screw it up if I um, No, but that would be great. <laughs> John, very nice to talk to you. Thank and you. All time. right. Okay, Enjoy. thanks a lot. Best wishes. And to you. Bye. To ensure you catch all the latest updates, please do subscribe to this channel, follow us on social media, sign up to our newsletter and join us on Patreon.